Spaceship Junkyard Chapter 2 The night was sleepless for Brian. His fascination with technology and the mysteries of the world had him thinking about tomorrow's trek. A sense of curiosity literally tore at his imagination, anticipating what they might discover. Morning came and Matt arrived as arranged. They got on the bike and said goodbye to their parents. Leaving the town, Matt turned into the fields and after a while stopped at the beginning of the forest. Okay, we need to figure out where to leave the bike here, he said. What do you mean, leave it here? It's not like we haven't got there yet. It's still a mile and a half, if not more, Chloe waved her hands, she hadn't counted on such a walk. We'll have to continue on foot from here, so the guards won't see us. When the motorbike's engine is running, it emits radiation that humans can't feel, but the drones guarding the dump will notice us immediately, Brian explained. They hid the motorcycle in the nearest bushes and began to move deeper into the forest. Brian, what do you know about the war on Mars? Did you study it at school? Matt inquired. Well, just in general. History is not my thing, Brian adjusted his cap. If I remember correctly, we opened the first base on Mars in 2048. At first it was just a science mission, but as time went on and our technology developed, it became practically a city. A mineral was discovered there, mines were opened, a lot of transport ships were built and we actively brought that mineral back to Earth. Even tourism began to develop. But then, it seems, in 2079 they discovered a signal coming from another civilization, and in another five or six years an alien ship appeared in the orbit of Mars, which was not friendly to our civilization. The war lasted four months, ours somehow blew up the ship and it was all over. That's pretty much what I know about those events. By now they had reached the fence surrounding the junkyard. Matt called a five-minute break and went to look for the place where he had gone through that fence earlier. Chloe pulled some mosquito spray from her rucksack, which had already made its presence felt deep in the woods, and she and Brian treated the exposed skin. Principal Smith was in the war, Chloe said. He even has a medal. He used to stand in for our history teacher and he used to reminisce about the war the headmaster of our school. Brian asked in surprise. Oh, did you ever notice that he has a prosthetic arm instead of a left hand? Chloe asked. By this time Matt had returned and they grabbed their rucksacks and followed him. After about a quarter of a mile they reached the edge of the canyon and ducked behind a boulder. Get the drone out, we need to do some recon and try to find a signal so we know which way to go. Matt said. I didn't know our director was at war, Brian rummaged through his pack, there you are, found it. They launched the drone into search mode, hovering in the air like a bird looking for prey, while they checked to see if there were any guard drones in range. Moments later, Brian activated the image and shared it with Matt and Chloe through the augmented reality lens. A mesmerizing view unfolded before them. A shallow canyon was buried in a thicket of greenery, and in its depths a river flowed lazily, like a living artery of nature. On either side of the river stood old spaceships, as if lost in time and the peace of their final moments. These ships looked weary of time, covered with lichen and overgrowth. Their shapes were a reminder that they had once been magnificent and ultramodern, but now they rested quietly on the shore, their luster lost in the depths of the past. Even amidst the greenery and nature, their metallic fragility stood out like monuments to a time when mankind reached for the stars but faced the bitter reality of interplanetary battles and emerged victorious. Despite their obsolescence, the ships seemed to hold the secrets of distant space travel and incredible adventure that had been lost in the dark days of the Martian War. Brian couldn't stand it any longer and ran out of hiding to the edge of the canyon. Matt and Chloe followed him and, as if on cue, turned off their lenses to see for themselves. This is just unbelievable. Matt whispered. I can't believe it's still here, said Chloe. It's like a portal to the past, Brian said. They stood in silence, taking in the beauty of the place. The sun was shining brightly and the air was filled with the sounds of nature. Let's go down, Matt suggested. 
They cautiously made their way down the slope of the canyon and approached the ships. They were really huge and their size was overwhelming. They looked like they were abandoned here a thousand years ago, Chloe said. Yes, Matt agreed. It's like they've been frozen in time. They walked around one of the ships, examining it from every angle. The ship was covered in a thick layer of rust, and its plating was corroded in places. I wonder when they got here. Brian asked. A few years after the war ended, Matt said. First one, then another ship was decommissioned, and so this scrapyard came into being. Is that where we're going? Chloe asked, looking at the drone remote. Yes, we need to head west, Brian replied. About two miles. The signal's over there. They walked down the canyon, looking at the ships, everything was there, passenger, military in large or carriers. This place is like a museum, Chloe said. It holds the memory of humanity's past. Yes, Matt agreed. But I haven't been to this part of the dump yet. They walked for about an hour, and around a bend in the river they came upon a huge military spaceship, the size of which was staggering. It was covered in a thick layer of armor, and there were numerous cannons on its side. The name was still easy to read because there wasn't much rust. Oh my god, Matt exclaimed. It's the Centurion. The very same Centurion. It's the most powerful and largest ship of the time. When the humans noticed the alien signal, they decided to build that battleship, and that ship was on battle watch in Mars orbit. I had no idea it had already been decommissioned. Wow, that's really something. It's so huge. Brian said admiringly, stroking the ship's plating with his hand. His face lit up with wonder, steeped in history and memories from history lessons and stories from his older comrades. So what about the signal? Chloe's question snapped the boys out of their euphoria. Brian was reaching for the remote when suddenly a security drone flew into the sky above them. Hide, now. Hurry, hurry. Matt yelled. The boys took cover in a small shuttle that appeared to have a hatch open at the rear. Another drone flew overhead. Five minutes later, Matt and Chloe, catching their breath, began to look around the interior of the shuttle, Brian was nowhere to be found. Brian. Brian, where are you? Call me back. Chloe called desperately. I'm here, guys. Brian, who was sitting at the wheel, called back. Get over here. You've got to see this. What, what is it? The boys stormed onto the bridge. Believe it or not, we found the source of the signal, it's coming from this shuttle. 